Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to another edition of me catching up with one of the greats in our sport, just back from Tokyo 2020. Myself and Michael Blackburn have found ourselves in the same hotel for hotel quarantine. Before we get into the interview, I just wanted to show you guys this image and give a bit more of an intro into Blackers. He's going to hate this. He's incredibly humble and I know during the interview he's going to want to focus on his athletes. So here he is himself on the podium in bronze medal position in the laser class at the Sydney 2000 Olympic Games. Also on the dais, Shite who won silver in Sydney after his gold in Atlanta. He also went on to win gold in the laser class in Athens, silver in the star in Beijing, bronze on the star in London, and then also went back to the laser in Rio and in Tokyo, where he was in both medal races, which was just amazing. Ainsley is in the gold medal position after coming second to Shite in Atlanta. He went on to win gold in Sydney with Shite there on the dice again and Blackers in bronze. The Finn, he then went on to win gold in Athens, Beijing and London. So two incredible sailors as well who I'm sure we all know on the dice there with the legend that we're talking to today, Blackers, who has focused on building the skills of others like the true champion that he is. So again, while in hotel quarantine, I thought maybe we could pass the time by catching up together. First of all, a big congratulations to you Blackers on three consecutive gold medals for your athletes, that is, at the Olympic Games. Absolutely fantastic work. Yeah, hey Nick, thanks for having me. Uh... Yeah, excited uh, that you're only a couple of doors away, but we can't see each other the whole time we're here. <laughs> I know. But, uh, yeah, really proud of uh, Wernie and, uh, of course, proud of uh, Tom and Tom before that. Um, mm. Yeah, really excited to get it done. Absolutely. I'm, I'm sure you are so proud of them. So I just, um, I thought we should run through exactly how the gold medal came about. And I'm, I'm going to bring up a quick picture here because this is, this is the end product right here, Matt on the podium there in the middle and uh, a very different Olympic Games though and a very different quad. It was a five year quad for the first time in, in my memory and when we talk about quads we're talking about four years of preparation. I mean, talk to me about the some of the hazards, the hurdles, the trials and tribulations, especially I guess in, in the last year and uh, and then leading into that game yeah a lot of lot of challenges a lot of pivoting in plans uh i guess this this whole thing started in the, in, certainly in the COVID side of things just after we finished our worlds in uh 2020 in melbourne that was uh a uh, almost meant to be the last of our selection regattas uh and it, it's just uh a little bit before that we had chosen uh matt Wern ahead of uh Tom Burton mm -hmm. and obviously a bit controversial to choose a person other than the person who was the uh, world champion and gold medalist from the um, Olympics beforehand but that was a, a carefully considered choice and it went to our uh, selection panel it was a basically a knife edge choice between the two of them and I think really either of them could have won the gold in, in, in Tokyo both extremely good sailors and extremely lucky to have both of them sailing against each other for a long time and, and that elevated both of their efforts. Yeah, I was, I was going to ask you about that and I guess that's the first hurdle in that quad was actually choosing between those two sailors. I mean, how do you, how do you choose between two who are so close? Uh, ultimately the right choice because there is a gold medal in the mix, but so tough. Yeah, well, years out for the, for the games, we the, the federation as a whole set a, a selection criteria. We, we picked the regattas that we thought were the best ones to uh, tell our athletes these are the ones you have to perform at, and then we ended up with uh, four of those. And and wouldn't you know it, they went kind of uh, scored one, two, four, two identically. Both of them scored those scores at those regattas. So um, it because they were both so good, it literally came down to a almost a toss of the coin decision. Um, but then we went a little further into the analysis, the results, and and when one beat the other, then uh, Matt, when Matt beat Tom, he beat him by 
a little bit more than when mm. Tom beat Matt in those three gathers. So that probably was the thing that tipped the balance in favour of Matt. Right. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, when Tom Burton won the Worlds, Matt was just behind him, I believe. Exactly. Only only a few points behind. It went that went down to the last race as mm. well. Yeah. Um, and then at the next regatta, which was the uh, test event mm -hmm. in 2019, uh, Matt beat Tom, but by like 20, 25 points or so. Yeah, okay. That makes sense. And, and to all those watching, I know that that was a, a big question for everyone. It doesn't mean that any of these sailors are better or, or worse than others. It just means that at that particular point in time, one was ready and selected. Yeah, exactly. I mean, that, and that's sport, you know, you can come down to these tiny little a decision here or there in one race can, can would have made the difference uh, between one or the other actually going. Yeah, absolutely crazy. Well, not crazy because, hello, there's a gold medal that we're talking about now, which is, which is just amazing. But a strange quad, a strange five years, a challenging five years. It started with that decision between Matt and Tom, defending gold medalist, uh, probably the, the toughest decision of, of your career wasn't your decision. And I, I guess you were in a really good spot as a as a coach. Either of these athletes could go on and win. Absolutely. I mean, what a fortunate situation to be in to have the one and two at the Worlds. Um, it, it doesn't happen very often. The, the previous time uh, Australian laser sailors finished one and two in the Worlds was back in 2006 uh, with me and Tom Slingsby. Um, so <laughs> it's a real it's a, it's a treasure, a little humble brag there. Um, but uh, yeah, it, it uh, you know, th those two and then the other guys in the squad uh, contributed a huge amount over the years um, through having this ability to, to, to train really competitively on a day-to-day -day basis. Yeah, and I'm sure we'll talk more about the squad in, um, in in the minutes to come. But talk to me about that last year leading up to the Olympics. Uh, it, it didn't stop at a choice between two very equal pegged athletes. We then had the hurdle of COVID and, and I mean, training away from Europe and doing the, the usual things that you would do. Uh, I mean, I guess that's really where the squad came into the, the fore, so to speak. Yeah, exactly. I mean, in back uh, when the Olympics got announced, they were postponed, we, we reset our plans around uh, another year ahead. We were hoping to get over to Europe in early 2021 to compete as we normally would. So we set a domestic uh, training plan up there and we in about uh, April, May last year, we, we packed all the boats on the trailer, ready to go to Queensland. And then they, they sat on the trailer for three months, I think, in Sydney, because oh. uh, we couldn't get away from uh, from Sydney. And, and, and we had uh, uh, Wernie uh, trapped in WA and uh, another uh, Finn trapped in Sydney. And, and so we had to improvise a lot. Uh, luckily, we drew upon the likes of uh, my previous coach, uh, Arthur Brett, to work mm -hmm. with uh, Wernie and uh, Swifto over in Perth. Um, so we liaise with him really well. Um, by the way, he's, he's back with the team now, uh, coaching the IQ foil class. Oh, wow. Um, so just been speaking with him earlier today about that, looking to head to the future. But uh, eventually we, uh, you know, the country opened up a little bit, so we, we, we were able to uh, have a, a much better program over the past uh, six months leading into the games, um, where the, the guys would, would, would go into a, a camp program where we want to do uh, two weeks on and uh, 10 days off a lot of the period. And we uh, started off, uh, we got camps in uh, Coffs Harbour a couple of times, uh, up in uh, Mooloolabar a couple of times. And then over the past couple of months into the games, we went uh, further north as winter came along um, up to Yipun. Lucky And guys. then the final camp. Yeah, we're <laughs> so lucky to be able to do this. And, and the final camp in Cairns. And we we just got up there before a couple of cases uh, slowed Sydney, Sydney down a lot. So when you look back on it, things worked out really well to be able to uh, move around the country and get those camps in, have the guys come in and out. And then we also had uh, a few of the Kiwi team come over to uh, add to our, our fleet. Absolutely fantastic. And I guess, um, 
I, this is probably where we should talk about the squad. You mentioned that you were just behind Tom Slingsby at the 2006 World Championships and then onward he went to 2008. And from out of that, from 2012 onwards, we saw the development of a squad of laser sailors that really sort of developed from, I guess, your rivalry to start with and friendship with Tom Slingsby and then on to Tom Burton and then on to Matt Wern. And, and that definitely is something that probably really, really supported the team in times of, of crisis. Yeah, yeah, very. And it's funny thinking, go back a bit further for a sec, Nick. The, um, you think about the sure. original inspiration for me getting into it was, you could say the, the grandfather of all this was Glenn Burke, <laughs> uh, three times Laser World's winner. And then part of my inspiration to work towards the laser at the Olympics. I had, the, I had a little crossover period early in my career where I sailed against him. And uh, then obviously I had a cross, good crossover period with Slingers. And then uh, followed with Slingers had a good crossover period with Tom Burton. So the, you know, that stand has been there in Australia for a long time. And there's, a, a, I think, a significant legacy effect. Um, and that's that's been strengthened a lot by uh, having a, a good squad uh, and good depth uh, through having five guys on the water who, who can just push each other uh, really hard on a, on a daily basis. Yeah, and goals as an athlete as well. I mean, you don't want to not be pushed. So it makes it a, a fun and rewarding environment for everybody too. And uh, and memories for me, here's, how's this for a full circle? Because my dad was uh, Glenn Burke's training partner for a while. And I remember that back in early days. And then, uh, and then I probably started doing what I'm doing because of Tom Slingsby's uh, unbroadcasted event in, uh, in London. So uh, it, it all revolves around the laser, which is pretty cool for Australia and a, and a lovely legacy that you're very much a big part of. Yeah, there you go. It, it's interesting. Some of the red ones here, there's, there's can end up being like five, six people you run into in your life that you, you kind of really make a big difference in which direction you take and where you bounce off and, and what you do. And, and yeah, certainly uh, Slingsby and Berkey are part of that for me. And, and, and obviously now uh, TB and Wernie are, are, are big parts of that as well. So the, the those sort of long-term impacts and influences on things are really interesting just to go back and have a look at. Yeah, it's a, it's a funny old world. And I have to say, um, I, I really enjoy watching how it, it does turn out and eventuate. And I guess a lot of people will be asking about what will be next for the amazing laser squad out of Australia. But to start with, I sort of want to go back a bit and talk about where you came from. You just mentioned that you crossed over a little bit with uh, the legend Glenn Burke. Uh, I mean, where did it all begin for you? When did you start sailing? Why the laser? Why did you end up wanting to go to the Olympics? Uh, give it to me in a nutshell. Oh, here's the, here's the, the boring bit. We would go back in time, but my, my no, dad was involved. In, <laughs> <laughs> my dad was involved in sailing. He uh, part of the 1970 America's Cup team uh, with uh, Sir James Hardy. Um, so he put us in a uh, Manly Junior on, in Middle Harbour in Sydney when we were very, very young and pushed us off and we went out and did a capsize drill and uh, and I, I jumped off and I cried and swam back to shore. Um, typical sort of start, I think, for uh, a lot of sailors. Um, but then from then on, my mum was extremely dedicated in actually taking us down to uh, the various clubs in Canberra. Uh, we lived there for 12 years and uh, got used to how to sail in shifty, uh, light and variable conditions. Um, and then it gradually led to uh, finding out what boat was the most competitive, what boat had the biggest fleet to sail in, which has which uh, made, it, made it more fun. Um, the thing I like about sailing is that the, the game of it, the, the chess pieces and the checkers and the strategy and tactics and, and, and how that all uh, goes into play. Um, so that's where the laser gives a lot of reward uh, through the fleet sizes uh, to be able to play the game uh, really in a fun and enjoyable way. Uh, the, the, the checkerboard though, the chess board in Canberra is uh, three-dimensional mm. and constantly pivoting. What a way to go. 
<laughs> Being a Canberra yeah. local, I can comment on Canberra. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. What a crazy place to sail. So, oh, so yeah, I, I, I went from there up to uh, Brisbane and, and they had waves up there, which was uh, quite a, a new experience <laughs> to have a bit of wind waves. Uh, and that uh, gave me a bit more fitness, a bit more hiking ability and, and uh, trained hard there with a, a few really keen training partners um, through the through the winters and gradually built up the boat speed. And once the boat speed was good, then I uh, started heading off to Europe uh, to uh, compete against the bigger fleets. Yeah. And, uh, and I guess that's where we all get our first taste as Australians as to what sailing is all about not that we don't have it in spades here and we've got all the opportunities but I guess it's like a massive stepping stone once you finally go overseas how was that experience for you yeah it was I, my first trip was uh, to uh, laser worlds for some reason we had there were two laser worlds that year one a world sailing worlds and one a regular worlds um, and uh, somehow I would uh, won a race or two in the one of those regattas so um the the craftiness that canberra taught me was uh put into play <laughs> there and, and it was uh, it was actually a really good experience um but then uh you know there's inevitably once you have something good happen in the sport of sailing then you're gonna have some bad results because you get a little bit cocky uh and i think you, you're too good so it, it's uh, always some good lessons coming out of everything and i think some of the some of the best uh improvements I had were actually going to New Zealand um, and, and doing some regattas there uh, just through the again the variability of the conditions and the the, uh, the, the high quality um, sailors they have over there to compete against. Well that's super interesting just across the ditch you uh, you found your way and speaking of across ditches um, something that I very much remember from your career not segway. only <laughs> segue not not only uh, your bronze medal at the 2000 Olympics, which I remember uh, dad basically like, bribing a family friend who had a boat to get out there to watch you. He was so involved then. Um, and so I couldn't help but be dragged, on, dragged along like a good little 15 year old sailing daughter. Um, this, this for me sticks in my mind as well when you decided to sail across a ditch or the ditch in Australia, uh, Bass Strait. Uh, should we have a little bit of a look at this trailer and then you have to talk to me about not only the bronze medal, but why one decides to sail across Bass Strait in a laser? <laughs> should we have a look? Yeah, let's do it. <laughs> Alrighty, here we go. Hello, I'm Michael Blackburn and this is a laser. I'm going to try and sail a laser dinghy from uh... Stanley in northwestern Tasmania across Bass Strait to Tidal River at Wilson's Promontory in Victoria. And you're going to do that in that little boat? Look, if it was easy, anyone would do it. Uh, this is going to stretch his limits for sure. We don't fully know what to expect, but nobody has sailed a laser across Bass Strait before. It's a tremendous piece of water, the Bass Strait. Three o'clock and all is well.
yes, there is a full documentary and people can watch it online. I've discovered it myself today. Now I'm impressed by two things in this video. Very impressed. Tell me. <laughs> Firstly, two things. <laughs> no, there's more than two things, but I'm going to highlight two things. How much has sailing fashion changed since 2005? <laughs> Love the Burke life It was life cold. Jacket. It was cold. I had to put everything on. I know. <laughs> but the old Burke life jackets, that's like before we got the midriff life jackets. Like that long ago. <laughs> yeah. I'm and, old. Um, that's right. Sorry. Also, no drone footage in this documentary. It's all from a copter. Yeah, back in 2005. So we uh, we did have a small budget. I, I helped, helped a lot by... Uh, uh, Tim Phillips from the wooden boat shop down in uh, Sorrento. Amazing. He provided the uh, support boat. And I had a, a cameraman who was actually a pro cameraman um, who sailed a laser out of my local club. So we're actually on an extremely low budget. Uh, did well to, to pull something together at all. And then I learned how to edit video and put it together and get some uh, cheap music to put over the top. And then my mum did some of the narration, <laughs> which you would have seen so as well. Good. Yeah, no, I love but, it. Um, yeah, is is a is a just a great fun trip. And you, you're going to ask me about why they why they do it, and and part of the reason is because it was it's there. Um, it, it you know 113 nautical miles, just the the right sort of distance could, that could be done in uh, in a day. Um, but also, motivation stemmed out of uh, coming back a year uh, to the Athens Olympics, uh, where they had a bit of a disaster, finished uh, ninth there, um, and then. All Olympic athletes get a little bit of post-Olympic depression, mm. where their, their their big goal is gone, uh, and they're just kind of looking for something else to fill it in. And I had all these skills um, about how to sail a laser, um, and uh, wanted another bit of a goal to put them in, in place and use them. Yeah, and I think this is where the the sail fitter phenomenon probably came from, which I know. A lot of people were probably familiar with but do you want to tell me a little bit about that about the book yeah tell me about it yeah i know yeah, it led so to it's... a hiking bench in my lounge room from an early age so i blame you for my hip problems but <laughs> well, yeah. I'm kidding. it's funny I'm you kidding. say that. Okay. no no I, we ran into uh bruce kirby who, who passed away recently the father mm. of the laser and uh at the, at the worlds in canada and, and having a function with him and everyone would walk up to him and say, you're the, you're the reason uh, for all my pain. <laughs> right, this device we have to, to hike off. Um, Legitimate. <laughs> but yeah, I'd, 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 uh, my university time was spent studying sports science. So mm. I ended up with a, a doctorate in sports science. So I learned a lot about uh, the physiology of, of uh, training and, and hiking. And, and uh, I collected a lot of that info in a, in a book, uh, sail sailing fitness and training available on, on uh, amazon uh and that's um been <laughs> not uh, that, that, that's been come to th <laughs> excellent come through uh three three different ed editions the last one uh, came out about uh, 10 years ago so mm. you would probably do it a bit of updating well maybe maybe that's a good goal for uh, for after tokyo 2020 but I know you've got plenty of uh, other things on your mind, but let's have a little bit of a talk now about the legacy, uh, not only of yourself in Australian sailing with a bronze medal, uh, but the long line of laser sailors that we've had now and three consecutive gold medals. Uh, talk to me about what that comes down to. Is it athlete selection, dedication, coaching, the program, all of the above. I mean, there has to be some sort of consistency across the board. And at the moment, the Australian sailing team and you as a coach are definitely one of the correlations. Yeah, I, I, I've obviously been there all along, but mm. uh, you also have to be very fortunate to have these guys come along who are you know, extremely dedicated, have the ability to learn skills well, the ability to handle pressure well in tough situations uh, and have the you know, the mindset to put all that together on a regular basis. Um, so, you know, extremely lucky to have the likes of Tom Tom and Matt uh, come through in the, in the time of being doing this. Um, without without those guys, then, you know, no chance even I could be in this position to coach three 
different guys to gold in three different games. Yeah, uh, absolutely amazing phenomenon, and you are very humble as well. But uh, all of them have given you a shout out on social media, and uh, we were talking off air just before we started this interview about how proud Tom Slingsby was as well of, of the successes and he was very involved. You guys are all so very tightly linked still, even though you've moved on to other things. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, Tom was on our selection panel for this recent game. So he helped choose uh, Matt. Uh, he's had a vested interest uh, in this. He, he's, he, a few years ago, he came uh, along to one of our training camps to to have a sale with the guys so you know very very keen follower and, and and very invested in that australian sailing team as well yeah very amazing and i um i will show a few pictures now speaking of being invested here is the the product of that legacy uh that that gold medal in tokyo 2020 which is what we are talking about but it sounds like uh Blackers, you might be taking a, a bit of a different role with Australian sailing now, leading on from uh, a, a career that seems to have been, I, I guess you are known for being a man of details. So I think it might be right up your alley. Yeah, that's right. Uh, I've taken a different tack uh, for, in a couple of weeks time. I'll officially change to a position called the technical director of the team. Um, and, and that's going to be, uh, in a way, a, a head coach, ro coach role. Mm -hmm. um, so we're also looking after the, uh, the technical aspects of the team, which uh, are, are going to lead to uh, good performances across the whole team. Um, we'll still have a, a, a boss, a uh, performance director. Um, so we've just got this slightly different structure where I would uh, have the ability to oversee or get across the class a little bit more. Um, rather than dedicate to one class in particular. Yeah, wow. Well, and so that that might be different for you, though, tearing yourself away from the laser. I mean, how many years have you been sailing the laser now, Blackers? Uh, started in 89, I think it was. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, it'd be fun, I think, to, uh, to go a little faster at times, uh, watching the other boats rather than going at four and a half knots everywhere. Yeah. Uh, and we've got the you know exciting new classes. There's going to be five different events effectively for the, the Paris Olympics because the 470 has been uh, bundled into a, a mixed event with guy and girl sailing. And then the uh, the two boards have changed to a falling board and then the uh, two kite events as well. So you know, busy working on uh, developmental uh, programs for all those classes. Yeah, four classes that haven't been part of the Olympics before. Well, actually five when you count the mixed 470. And we didn't have any representatives in boards at this Olympics. So what are your thoughts on boards in particular? Now they're such a, I mean, they're 40% now of our, of our events. Yeah, exactly. We, we, we can't ignore that. And we've got to uh, work hard to, to get the, uh, we have got a bunch of young enthusiastic sailors who are working at, at that already. Um, so there's a big opportunity for them um, to to develop, uh, and we've got uh, programs in place to try and help them along and, and do the best we can. But it takes time, um, as you said. The last uh, uh, last board sailor we had at the games so was Jessica Crisp in 2012. Yeah, uh, remember Jess well. <laughs> yeah, 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 legend. Great sailor. Yeah, mm. and then uh, yeah, it's obviously lapsed. So we're, we're kind of starting again. Um, and when you look at uh, what's going on in, in Europe and the US, uh, they're, they're already a fair way ahead of us. So we're going to need some clever ideas to catch up. Oh, that's that's really great to hear. So I don't want to hold you any longer, um, Blackers. I think we've had you on the line now for about half an hour, and that's that's a lot of valuable time from our, our new technical director. So uh, from from me to you, I'm I'm pretty um, pretty excited because. You are as humble as they come, but you definitely do have a positive, uh, positive effect on our athletes. And I'm pretty excited for that to be spread further across the board. That's for sure. Yeah, thanks, Nick. I mean, look, I think this is just a fantastic sport to be involved. You know, there was a, a survey through the Sports Commission of what, 
what sports are most enjoyable in this country, rated by the participants, and, and surfing and sailing rated one and two. So, oh, awesome. just trying to you know, share share some of the love around. Yeah, absolutely. Well, that's super awesome to hear. And speaking about sharing some of the love, I have my call for you here. When Matt came across the line, I can't sh- share the vision because that's off limits. But I might share the audio with you if if you like. Would you like yeah, to hear? Yeah, to. As is yeah. the German. Okay, here we go. As we come into the finish, it is the Frenchman Jean Baptiste Bellet who leads, but he won't steal one minute. excited there but yes um it was a, a pretty cool moment so that was from the uh, the commentary box in in Enoshima uh well the SPP box I should say now before I let you go I think we just need to have a little bit of a look at this photo that I have acquired what is going on here blackers as you know, Nick, we get our lunch, breakfast, and dinner delivered in uh, paper bags. Um, so we end up with uh, you know, 30, 40, 50 paper bags uh, over the time we're here. So uh, just wanted to uh, be a little creative and exercise another part of my mind while we were stuck in the room for 14 days. So I made a boat um, out of the, and I got the ironing board and I had to take the uh, lampshade off the lamp for a user <laughs> mast. <laughs> a little bit of sticky tape and a little bit of wire I had and some rope and uh, there you go. Not, I uh, love it. not a you great make... sign, but uh, yeah. <sighs> you make me feel so much more sane building an Arc de Triomphe, let me tell you. <laughs> I gotta say. It's happened. Slight fire hazard and no idea how long it will last. Behold the arch. Oh I thought I was I was going a bit mental, but uh, apparent apparently not. We're just sailors and we've got to do stuff. So um, on that note, I'm going to let you go. Sorry for holding you up, but here um here's my favourite photo from the Tokyo 2020 Olympics. Besides uh, besides him coming alongside to say hello to you, this one here I think um, is a a little bit special. And, uh, and the crowd was just amazing. Even though we had no spectators, this is all of the sailors. It was definitely the biggest crowd by far up on the wall for the laser full rig. Even though there, there was, you know, no need really for Matt to sail that race. He did it with a race to spare. I know that that's a big feat as well and something you've wanted for one of your athletes for some time. How was the crowd? It was so good. Yeah, so good, and it's our support staff, the sailors, and and, and anyone else who could, could have gotten in there. Um, yeah, it was yeah awesome to have something there at all in a, in Olympics where there you know the normal crowds uh, couldn't happen. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you for your contribution. As I mentioned at the start of this, it was 
I think it was just as hard on support staff as it was athletes this event. I'm so happy it went ahead though because I really think it's provided much needed inspiration and hope. You mentioned that athletes can have a bit of a come down if they don't succeed. I think maybe now uh, the general public can sort of understand what it feels like to be lacking inspiration and hope. So thank you so much for all that you and the Australian sailing team did to inspire Australians whilst you were in Tokyo. I have to say, it seems like there is definitely a common thread of resilience throughout these athletes, especially with so many coming back from defeat. Hopefully we get a bit more of a chance to talk to Wernie. I am uh, hoping to talk to him. I will be talking with Matt Belcher and also Victor Kovalenko in the coming days. But here we have just a few little shots again of Blackers himself on the podium winning a bronze and three gold medalists that he has coached at the past three consecutive Olympics. And, and thanks to all uh, from the Tokyo 2020 uh, Olympic organising committee who actually got this event to happen because I really do think we needed it. Yeah, great, great. Uh, thank you for the Japanese people and, and thanks for your support. Oh, totally welcome. Thank you, Blackers. We'll be back with plenty more action over the coming days.